Welcome to our sixth, maybe, uh, community college webinar of the year. Today's topic is finding research opportunities as a California community college student, something Tiffany and I are both really passionate about, and I'm really excited to be joined by Tiffany, who you'll meet in a minute. Just a reminder, if you are not already aware, we have three more webinars to go. Uh, we've had six already this month. Next week, if you're interested in learning more about civil and environmental engineering, we'll have an info session on Tuesday at noon, and that will be led by faculty from the department. Whether you're interested in civil or not, I think that's a really valuable experience to attend. And then at the same time, there's a material science and engineering presentation. Material science is a major here at Berkeley that people um, often don't know about, but it's really exciting. And um, they really care about supporting transfer students because it's a small department. There's lots of opportunity to meet uh, your peers and your faculty. Hence the fact that they have a whirlwind hour and a half of presentation, faculty and student panels and q and I know people who have changed their major after attending that. And then the following week, just to wrap up the series, I will be holding a drop in office hour as the manager of transfer success initiatives to answer any questions that you haven't had answered uh, through all of our webinars. So you can register for any of those sessions at uh, engineering.berkeley.edu forward slash CC. Miranda, to answer your question, I don't know that Dr. Sherburn will be attending the material science and engineering uh, presentation. In the past, it's been primarily Professor Lane Martin and Professor Zach Albalushi, who are both um, really great speakers. Some logistics for today, as you heard, the session will be recorded and it will be posted to the same link I just provided, and you will receive an email in a week or two once those are all uploaded. You can ask any questions through the session through the Q&A feature. I ask that you use that instead of the chat. The chat moves really fast as people are reacting to things and being excited about their, their field. So use the Q&A for any questions that you might have that you'd like us to answer and upvote them if you agree with someone else's question. And Tiffany and I will try to get to as many questions as possible. And to answer your question, Kevin, EECS is not going to host a webinar this year. Unfortunately, they are understaffed and it just was not possible with everything else going on. So with that, Tiffany, thank you so much for being here. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Tiffany Reardon and I work uh, with Nicole. We are part of the programs team in Engineering Student Services and I am the Associate Director for our Engineering Excellence Programs. So it is a delight to meet you all um, even though we are virtual, I hope to meet a lot of you um, on campus at some point, whether you're in TTE in the summer or um, in spring, if you've been admitted or, you know, maybe at, at various events, uh, you know, throughout the network. So it's great to be here. Thank you. And you'll see in a minute what an expert Tiffany is on finding research experiences as a community college student. Um, and because I didn't start with it, my name is Nicole McIntyre. I am the manager of transfer success initiatives for the UC Berkeley College of Engineering, which means my whole job is to help folks prepare for transfer, uh, be involved in the application and recruitment process, and then to create and run programs along with Tiffany for transfer students once they're here. I'm also the director of the Transfer to Excellence program, which you'll hear about in the second half of today's session. And um, as a aside, I'm the education director for a research center, uh, which is at five universities nationwide, including UC Berkeley, Stanford, and MIT. So I also am passionate about research and getting more students involved in research. Tiffany, I don't know where you want to start or where you'd like me to start. So do you want to start with the what is research? Sure. 
So I went to UC Berkeley, like many of you hope to do, and um, I never participated in research. I graduated from Berkeley with two degrees, not really knowing what research was and thinking that it had no place for me because I wasn't as smart as the professors that I had. So I think it's really important that we start by even understanding what are we talking about when we talk about research experiences. And to be clear, this is the gathering of data to answer a question, right? Much like you've seen in the labs that you may have taken in high school or community college, you pose a question, you do experiments, which all vary based on the field that you're in, right? Gathering data to answer a question in biology is gonna look different than gathering data to answer a question in computer science. And then you have to be sure to present that answer to the world. Doing experiments, doing research, but not being engaged in science communication and sharing the results doesn't actually accomplish much because it doesn't move your field forward. Research can be really repetitive, exhausting, frustrating. And that's in part because unlike the labs that you've taken in classes, it hasn't always been done before. Right? In science classes, a professor or a teacher normally can tell you the materials and the process, and they know that if you do everything right, you will get certain results in a two hour time period so you can go home. Research is not like that because you are creating new knowledge. You are pushing the field forward. So that requires a lot of uh, resilience to failure and patience, but is really exciting because again, you are creating what's gonna be in the next textbook instead of just practicing what someone else discovered 50 years ago. And so for those reasons, it's a really great opportunity to be creative and to apply what you've learned in your classes in a real practical sense. I'm gonna hand this one off to you, Tiffany. So um, right now it is uh, October, what are we, 27th, I believe. Um, so some of you are actually going to be applying. You're going to be applying uh, this, um, this admission cycle. Some of you next admission cycle and some of you um, after that. So a lot of times I talk to students and they say, well, I would like to do research, but I want to wait until I go to the four year. Nicole and I are here to tell you, you don't have to wait. You do not have to wait to do research. Um, so why? Why do research as a community college student? Well, the number one reason is because it can strengthen your transfer applications. One of the questions that you'll see, and I realize that you're likely applying to multiple schools, um, one of the things that you'll see is, you know, how have you prepared for your major and upper division coursework? Certainly, um, not only will it strengthen your transfer application, but it will demonstrate interest in your major. It'll also help you understand the applications of your major. Right now, as STEM majors, as engineering majors, a lot of you are taking math, you're taking chemistry, you're taking physics. So you have students that are in all of your um, classes that are probably in different majors. So if you're not sure, you know, maybe you have never heard of, of material sciences and you say, oh, that sounds kind of cool. Like what exactly is material sciences? Or maybe you're a, a chemical engineering major and you're not sure, you know, what else there is. Having this research experience can give you a better understanding and prepare you for not only your dream jobs, but the upper division coursework when you do transfer. It'll also help you build connections at your dream school. So maybe you're, you know, you have a list of schools that you're interested in going to, but if you actually do research at that school, you'll have a better sense of what the school offers. You'll be able to work with faculty, you'll be able to work with uh, students and um, things are fortunately, uh, you know, improving for the better on the COVID front. So the likelihood is you'll be able to do that research in person, which is, which is great. And I just want to highlight in the picture, I believe this is Kayvon from Diablo Valley College who was on the call, who has done research as a community college student, um, presenting his research here at UC Berkeley. And then on the left, we have Elisa Pashina, who also did research as a student at San Diego Miramar College. 
And to Tiffany's point, continued on to transfer to UC Berkeley and continue doing her research here um, on campus. So the types of research programs. So all of you are um, community college students. So we're gonna kind of go over uh, the different uh, types of research that's available uh, that you should start exploring if you're interested in research. The first, which uh, would be summer REU programs. So summer REU programs, that would, the REU stands for Research Experience for Undergrads. Um, these are formal summer research programs in which students are brought to either a, a university campus or a national lab where students will do summer for a specified um, amount of time. You'll work with the faculty uh, member in a lab, um, sometimes called a PI, the principal investigator. You usually will get a research uh, graduate mentor and you will uh, do this full-time research experience. Oftentimes, in addition to the day-to-day -day research, you might have some outings, some fun you know, community building activities, maybe some professional development, information about graduate school. And these are usually paid experiences. I love when I talk to students before and after because you really, really do see a transition. Either the transition is I love research or eh, maybe not for me, right? Either way, it's a valuable experience overall and it's a fun experience. And I think that there are a lot of programs looking for motivated students that are uh, interested in doing research. Whether you've had zero research, there are programs out there that are looking for you. So don't, don't feel like you have to be an expert. You just have to have the passion and the interest and the aptitude to do research. Um, the second time would be academic year research. So this would be, um, some of you at the community college, um, you might actually have, uh, some of you might actually be doing research and not realizing it. I remember I was talking to one of our chemical engineering students who was telling me about some work that he did at his community college. And I said, you do realize you are doing research, right? So maybe you are doing research um, and there are opportunities. So academic year research would be just that. That's you do research part-time during the academic year. Some of you might have uh, schools that um, have partnerships with local schools. So for example, I know in the LA area, there are a number of schools that have a partnership with UCLA. Um, if you are close to a university campus, I would look and see if there are any uh, partnerships already. The beautiful thing about that is that sometimes they have partnerships with specific schools. For example, I don't know if we have any Pasadena folks, but I'd be very surprised if JPL doesn't have some partnership with uh, PCC. So that's the second one. And the third is a short-term research project, which is just that. So a short-term research project that you have worked on, um, it could be maybe you've done something independently, something you've done with a faculty, uh, but these are the different types of programs that you'll encounter. So how do you find research? Um, it can be very overwhelming. If you go on the, uh, you know, on the web and start looking around for different, um, you know, programs, you will find a lot and you can spend a lot of time. We've compiled a short list just to make it easy for you because we know you're all busy engineering and STEM students and, and you want to maximize and be efficient about your time. So the first one is Pathways to Science. I really like this website. It's a really good one because you can filter it by uh, discipline if you'd like. So maybe you're interested in aerospace, maybe you're interested in bioengineering, uh, maybe you're interested in AI. You can go on to Pathways to Science and you can search by that. Maybe you're looking for a research program on the East Coast. You can filter it by that. The second one is the NSF REU search. I have to tell you, it is not the most exciting website. Um, the NSF one will tell you whether or not um, there's a uh, program at that school. So Nicole has, uh, has uh, click on um, engineering. So click on engineering. You'll see essentially 
the schools that have REU programs uh, focused on engineering. Now the challenge is, let's just say you uh, go on the uh, Auburn University, for example. So go on Auburn, you click there, and then you have to click again, see, so click again. And then you have to click again and you say, okay, what is this program? How do I apply? And you go and you, um, you learn more information about the program. So that's, uh, it's helpful to know if there is a program, but there's a lot of uh, clicking involved. So there's, there's a lot of that. So in this particular program, as you can see, um, this program, you must be a US citizen or a permanent resident of the US. Most programs that are NSF funded have that stipulation, but uh, something that a lot of uh, programs have, they have multiple uh, funding sources. So if they have multiple funding sources, then the beautiful thing is it's not limited to that. Um, another one, uh, Duke University, this is a good one. This is a really good program. This one, uh, Meeting the Grand Challenges in Engineering. This is a good one. It's been around for a long time. And this is a pretty broad one. So you can do uh, research at Duke and it's uh, based on the grand challenges. So um, last summer's obviously was, was very likely online. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, this summer, a lot of programs will be in person, which, which is great because you can, you know, travel to another state perhaps, or, you know, and this program um, looks like the link is broken, uh, but many of these programs, they will either have predetermined uh, projects. So you either apply and you talk about the project that you wanna work on. So this is good. So if you go up, um, you can see that they have uh, a listing of projects and you would wanna take some time and you would want to uh, go over the projects and maybe talk about you know, why you wanna work on that project with that faculty member. Sometimes they're not predetermined. Sometimes they will uh, accept your application. I think uh, Caltech, Caltech has like six programs, but uh, sometimes they will, you know, you don't have to, to say which program you wanna work on. They'll, they'll do a match for you. Um, but it is always good to have some idea of the research that they're offering and what the research thrusts of the program are. So this is a good one. So you can see, uh, for example, this is a good one because um, the uh, it's on autonomous systems, and it looks like they are focusing on uh, improving uh, urban infrastructure. So that might be of interest to a variety of majors. So you know you want to take some time to really understand the program that you're applying to. Also, very important is it field research. I one time had a student who applied for a, re a field research program and she was not the most outdoorsy person, but she didn't know that because she didn't read it. She just said, oh, I wanna do you know, research at this school. So it wasn't a, a good fit. So that's, um, that's the second one. So the second one is the NSF list. So that's a good one. I just <laughs> want to uh, cut in, Tiffany. Someone sure. asked in the Q&A, how do I show oh. I'm motivated to do research? And oh. the application is going to ask you essay questions and whatnot, but Tiffany's advice that she just shared is a main way that I make that decision about a student is, have you looked at the research I'm offering? Are you able to talk about it? Have you put the time into understanding the projects that are available and you're able to speak to which are of interest to you and why? For me, that shows that you're a self-directed learner. It shows that you're committed to my program. And if I accept you, you're likely to come. Um, and that you really are passionate about the research area that I'm offering. Definitely. It's always a tell if you don't read uh, the application. It's, it's always a tell. We can always tell if you did it. The third, and full disclosure, this is my website. Uh, I don't make any money off of this. Uh, I probably spend more than I make on this website, but it's, a, it's really something that I, I love doing and enjoy doing. Um, so I created this particular website because um, a lot of students will find that, um, you know, maybe the, the NSF site is only limited to US citizens. Uh, maybe you're an international student, maybe you're an undocumented student, maybe you're a first year student, maybe you have, you know, 
maybe you're just you know taking your first semester of courses so i wanted it to be easy for students because i know you're super busy so let's for example let's click on community college students because that is our uh our audience today so these are programs and i'm adding programs all the time i mean i i do this you know in my spare time um so these programs are specifically programs that have a um uh, you know, a focus on community college students. Um, and so these are programs that that have, there you go, TTE, which you'll hear a lot about front and center, but these are programs that are designed specifically for community college students and programs that, um, that are looking for you as community college students. So this is a good site because um, you'll know exactly what they're looking for. So for example, if you can scroll down a little bit, Nicole, um, on this particular one, and then stop right there. So we have uh, levels. So levels would be uh, current community college students, minimum GPA 2.0, and then the citizenship requirements, the deadline, and then the application link. So it's all there for you on a silver platter. There you go. You have all that stuff. So you don't have to click around. And then if you don't meet one of those requirements, you just move on to the next one, right? So I um, try to make it as easy as possible for students to navigate the site. Again, I, I actually have a lot of these programs emailing me directly, which is awesome, because then I can pass that information along to you. So uh, this is a great one. So you've got Pathways to Science, the NSF REU, um, the NSF REU Search, and then REU Finder. So a very important tip is only apply to programs that you're eligible for. So for example, if they are looking for uh, juniors and seniors and you are a, a community college student, then you probably wouldn't be a good match for that program. But uh, one of the questions, and this is a great question, how much background experience do you need to apply for these programs? There are programs that will specifically say no prior research experience is necessary. So a lot of these programs have a broadening participation component, um, which is great because if you don't have any research experience, then you can uh, apply for this program. And uh, by the end of the summer, you will have a very robust uh, research background. So definitely um, apply to these programs. Um, so how do you find research? So um, one thing, so I would say if, if you decide to use the REU Finder site, don't just look at the uh, community college page. I would also look, um, if you are looking at programs, look for programs if you are a first generation college student, if you are a veteran, and when it says students from institutions with limited research opportunities, example, community colleges, right? So sometimes they don't say specifically we're looking for community college students, but they will say students from institutions with limited research opportunities. So if it says that, then that's a really good hint like, hey, that's you know a, a great um, kind of clue that, that you might be a good candidate for that. If you're a US veteran, there are a lot of programs. I know the University of Washington has a program specifically for US veterans. Um, and a number of other programs as well. So those are programs that you can apply to. First generation college student. When we say first generation college student, we typically mean that neither of your parents completed a four year degree in the United States. So for example, maybe your uh, brother is going to UC Davis, right? And you say, okay, well, I'm not a first gen because my brother goes to Davis. No, no, no. You are a first gen if neither of your parents uh, graduated from a four-year institution. Um, so that's helpful. And then uh, next slide is, so here are some opportunities that we've curated for you. So we have the Community College Institute, which is just right up the hill at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So you should apply for that program. They have a summer program called the CCI program. There's also the NIH Bridges to Baccalaureate program. That's a good one as well, because that is a partnership with a um, four-year school and with um, nearby community colleges. So remember when I indicated that, you know, sometimes your 
community college might have a partnership with a four-year school. There are a number of them. And then um, the NASA Community College Aerospace Scholars, that is a good one as well. Um, they are looking for students at community college um, to do that program. And Nicole and I have actually had, a, we actually co-teach a class together and we were looking at resumes today. And fun fact, we actually saw a student that participated in that program uh, because he put it on his resume. So these are these are really good programs that we have seen, you know, kind of the, the results uh, and the students that have participated in them. And last but absolutely not least, uh, the Transfer to Excellence Summer Research Program, which you're gonna hear a lot more about. Um, if any of you are uh, MESA, um, may, any of you might be MESA, um, ask your MESA director if they um, you know, have any partnerships. Ask your uh, STEM advisors, ask your faculty, right? Um, the thing is, is that you don't know what you don't know, right? So ask, uh, connect with people, connect with people on LinkedIn, connect with us on LinkedIn, right? Um, put yourself out there because um, there are programs that, you know, that specifically want you, want you as, as community college students, and um, they understand and they know um, all that you bring to the table. Awesome. Tiffany, we have some questions. I'm going to pause before we tra transition into TTE and maybe we can answer those together. Um, Okay, here we go. Tiffany, if I'm planning on transferring by next fall, can I still apply for a summer program? Yes, of course you can. Absolutely. Um, definitely. You, you can and you should. Uh, you should definitely apply. Awesome. There are a lot of questions about whether things count. And I think that's reference to us saying that doing research can help enhance your transfer application. And so I want to address all of those as a group by saying, your transfer application is not a black or white thing. It's not like, oh, you've got to have one research experience. Do you have it? Yes, you check the box. It's really you know, a matter of using the essays to explain how you have prepared for your major, what you want to do with your major, why you're passionate about transferring and getting a degree. So anything counts. You can list anything you want. And we talked about this a bit in the first webinar. It's really a matter of what you get out of it, right? And how you're able to explain it. And, you know, if you're doing research just for it to count on your application, you're likely not gonna enjoy it because of, you know, it can be frustrating. It is a big time commitment. So I would think more so in terms of like, did you get enough out of it? Did you enjoy it? If so, try something else. If you have, you know, done independent research, look to transition those skills to the labs of a professor and do something with a professor. If you're applying to a research institution, doing research at a research institution is gonna help your application more you know, than you saying, let me build an anthill. I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, there's, um, there's also uh, uh, a lot of, I, I know a lot of community colleges have honors programs. So maybe um, if you're in an honors program and there's an opportunity to do independent research, please take advantage of that. Um, I remember when I used to work at a community college, we would have students that would take honors uh, sections of a class and they actually had a, a really cool uh, research symposium at Stanford. And so students would present their research. So if you have those opportunities, uh, please take advantage of those. I mean, they will help you immensely. Awesome, thank you. Tiffany, you keep saying that some of these programs will pay you. Yeah. Um, are there any programs where you have to pay as the participant? And if so, does financial aid apply? So I would be very, very suspicious of a program that wanted you to pay. What I will say is I do see, because um, I also uh, have a, a growing list of high school programs. So high school programs, it's a little bit different. So there are some high school programs that um, you have to pay, but there's always fee waivers and financial aid. But if there is a research program and you're all undergrads, and if they're asking you to pay, I, I would probably um, discourage you from that. I mean, essentially, you know, if they're asking you to pay money, 
that that just seems kind of uh, just I don't know, just something seems wrong with it. Um, I would also be very uh, cautious about doing a summer program in which you don't get paid, even though it might be fun and you might enjoy it and say, oh, I would do this for free. At the end of the day, it is work. And um, you should be compensated. So I would definitely, and, you know, maybe if you're like, well, you know, I'm not a U.S. citizen, I'm not a, you know, um, whatever. Um, they have funding. So, so you should definitely. And um, also, you know, there are ways. I, I had a colleague one time who ran a MESA program, and he actually allocated funding for students to um, do research at a four year. So if that's something that's that's possible, you know, maybe you can negotiate something like that. Absolutely. We also have a question about the timeline. And the question is something about, are these during the spring? Um, so to clarify, we talked about a number of different programs and Tiffany highlighted that some of them are during the summer, um, specifically the full-time ones where you may go and live in another state and get paid. Uh, but those last two on the slide could be in the spring, the fall, or the summer. Um, so if you're someone who's not busy in the summer, they may be an option. The applications right. oh, for the programs, oh. Tiffany, when do those normally open and close? Um, so just really quickly, there are um, also, they do sometimes, um, you don't see a ton of them, but there are winter ones, like many, you know, smaller ones. Um, I know Brookhaven National Lab um, sent me some information that I'll be posting on RU Finder, and they have one, which is a, a quick uh, research program. Davis used to have one, which was a really good one. I think it was like a two-week program. But to answer your question, um, usually uh, November through March, that's kind of the window when you apply to these summer programs. And then of course, uh, if you're doing a spring program, spring program would be hard um, if, you know, I mean, it's doable, but, but you also wanna be sure that you're focused on your grades. So then your grades don't slip. So then you can, you know, be competitive for transferring. But I would say November to March is kind of the, uh, time window of applying to these programs. Also, I want to point out uh, one, uh, some of the terminology that you might encounter. Um, sometimes they will say rolling admissions. If it says rolling admissions, what that means is that they have a deadline, but if they get a strong candidate, it is possible that they will contact you before. I don't know if you do that, Nicole, with TTE, you do before, um, but I used to do that uh, when I ran an REU, I would say like, oh, this student's really strong. Let me let me try to recruit the student. So if it says rolling admissions, as you make your list of programs, I would prioritize that program, the rolling admissions one, as one that you might want to apply to early. Okay, here's my last question before we move on. Tiffany, are there ways to work directly with a professor right now? And will college professors respond to cold emails? Great question, Paj. Um, yeah, I mean, we have had student, we've had student, we've had high school students work with professors. Um, but when you have a cold email, um, you don't want to do a generic email. Um, you want to really give them some uh, connection. Um, I think that a good place to start would be um, how you found out about their research, how you found out about their research and how it ties into your academic goals. Maybe you did, um, you know, maybe you, maybe you're use their textbook, right, at your school and you love their textbook and you, you know, or maybe there's some connection. But definitely the connection is key. What you don't want to do, and Nicole and I get these all the time, you don't want to write a generic email that says like, I would love to do research in your lab, right? You want a specific one. Also, uh, when things, get, you know, a beautiful opportunity, you know, you know that Nicole has set up all of these uh, webinars. 
go to these webinars and follow up and talk to the, you know, talk to the faculty, right? Talk to the faculty that are there, get their contact information, email them, connect with them on LinkedIn. You have this personal connection. So you don't have to do a cold email. Also, if you go to conferences, um, SOCNIS is coming up fairly soon. Um, that would be a good opportunity. SHIP will be coming up fairly soon. That'll be a great opportunity. So really networking with people. So then it's not a cold email. So then it's an intentional email. Sockness is actually right now. They moved it fluid this year. Oh, it's it's now interesting. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'm going to move ahead and talk a little bit about the transfer to excellence program with our last 20 minutes. Um, yeah, and Tiffany, if you want to answer the last three questions in the chat, you know, we might have time uh, to come back to them at the end, but I don't know for sure. Okay. And so let me share my screen again. So that was a really great introduction to how to find research and lots of different options. I'm going to talk about one program specifically that we have at UC Berkeley. Um, I think some of the information is valuable, including the advice for how to prepare a strong application, whether you're eligible for this program or not. But if you already know you're not eligible, um, I won't be hurt if you log off now. Totally up to you. But Transfer to Excellence is a really exciting uh, program. We have some of our former participants here on the call today, which I'm happy to see their faces or their names. Um, and we are a program, one of those paid summer research programs that Tiffany introduced, and we are specifically for California community college students, meaning that you are not competing against a third year that goes to Harvard and a senior from the University of Texas. We are specifically looking to prepare students from our community college system for transfer by introducing them to research. The uh, official party line is that we intend to inspire them, but I think if you're applying to a program like this, you're already inspired to transfer. So my personal objective as the director of the program is to introduce you to research so you can make an educated decision about whether you want to do more of it. Research is a really big part of graduate school too. So by trying research early, you can both uh, make an informed decision about if you may wanna get your master's or your PhD, and you can start working towards that application, which probably feels really far away right now. The program is nine weeks during the summer. Uh, for 2022, it is tentatively June 10th, which is my birthday, through August 13th. Um, and we provide funds for you to get to Berkeley. If you're a flight away, we'll buy your flight. If you're driving, we'll pay for your gas. We provide a dorm room and your meals for the nine weeks, and we pay a $3,600 stipend for your time uh, because you are skilled uh, scientists and because we don't want students to have to choose between working a summer job and uh, doing research. And the main meat of the program is having your own independent research project that is supervised and you receive mentorship from our professors, postdocs, and graduate students here at Berkeley. And so that means you're responsible for something start to finish. You're not just washing beakers or debugging code for a graduate student, but you have your own project that you see through. And all of the pictures on these slides are from our participants. I'm seeing the chats. I hope this is about the program. Um, I see a, a comment about not being able to do TTE because of the quarter system. That's a really valid frustration. And when I pick the dates, I pull so many academic calendars and try to find the dates that work for the most schools possible. I have had quarter system students participate if they're able to work with their faculty to take their midterm, their final exams like early or at night. Um, so it, it, it has been done and it can be done, but it does require flexibility from the students and the faculty, which is unfortunate. Someone asked about links. You can just Google transferred excellence. Um, pretty much everything Tiffany and I are offering you, you can find through a Google search. So in addition to working on a research project in a UC Berkeley lab, our interns um, participate in seminars that are relevant to different types of research, careers in science and engineering, 
Uh, we also have a lot of seminars about the transfer process and um, the, I need to close the chat because I'm getting distracted, and science communication. So if you've done a research project, how do you present that at, at a conference? How do you write a paper so someone else can benefit from it? We also have lots of social activities. So you make friends, you participate in the Transfer Alliance Project Advising to help you uh, continue to build a strong transfer application. And we have online mentoring for the year following the program. So you don't just come do all this research and then go back to your community college like it never happened. Um, in these pictures on the top one, we have students, uh, Victoria from Cabrillo, Elisa from San Diego Miramar, Megan from Irvine Valley, and Crystal from Skyline. And they have all transferred to UCs besides Elisa on the left transferred to Stanford and actually changed her major based on her experience in the program. And then in the bottom, we have Ted from LA City, I believe, but maybe a different LA one. And Ted actually interned with Professor Jennifer Doudna, who won a Nobel Prize last year. So he did his research on Nobel Prize winning uh, technology, which for those of you in bio, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. Jennifer Doudna is one of the two faces of that technology. And so he applied to transfer with her name on his applications and with letters of rec from her lab, which is amazing. He transferred to Berkeley, is studying bioengineering, and is still doing research with Professor Doudna. Um, Tiffany, just real quick, that's not um, the current link anymore link to the program here. So what are the benefits of participating in this program? Hopefully you've already heard many of them, but you get to experience life as a researcher and student at UC Berkeley, which is a very low commitment, right? To do nine weeks, if you hate research, you don't have to keep doing it. You get to gain experience to discuss in your application, learn how to conduct scientific research and how to communicate that so that you push the field forward, you get to build lots of strong connections, both with UC Berkeley people and with your colleagues, other community college students. And you receive additional advising and support for transfer to a four-year institution. So, so much to gain and you get paid. And it's, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really great experience. Um, there are research, there's research happening in many different areas. Tiffany showed you some examples of places with really diverse research and we are working to accomplish that. So we um, have research projects in many different fields. I can tell you that computer science and electrical engineering specifically, we have lots of faculty. Um, sometimes we don't have enough applicants in those areas. So if you're interested in EE or CS, I strongly encourage you to apply. Um, and you can see some of the other areas here. One of the best ways to determine if we might offer research that is interesting to you is to um, look at the past research projects. So the projects that people worked on last year, a lot of those professors will continue to participate and you'll work on the future um, iteration of that project. So I can show you real quick, um, if we look at the archive, which is on the old TTE website, TTE program archive right here on the right. And again, this advice applies to other programs as well. You can see right here last year's program and read about the research that they did. So this is a great way to think about what kind of projects we might be offering in the future. And a great way to build your application is if you told me I really liked what Miriam, Kara, and Adam did with Professor Chakraborty for these reasons, and this is how it aligns with my major, that is a strong application. You also, if you're accepted, you might be working on the next stage in one of these projects, right? We don't have research and then just forget about it. Typically, research continues to evolve. So, um, if we go look at Kayvon's project, which we saw earlier, Kayvon worked on a quadrupedal robotic guide dog. So how do we use robots to replace guide dogs? Because guide dogs, you know, die, they have to be trained individually. And how do we teach um, that voice to text and, and voice to action 
relationship. Kayvon would be able to explain this so much better. But my point is, if you came and worked with us next summer, you might be working on the next stage in this, right? You might be working on the vision part of the robot or decision making or continuing to work on that um, speech interface. <laughs> Kayvon, I read a lot of your papers, so I, I'd like to think it was a decent summary. Awesome. So who is eligible? Uh, for our program specifically, and this does not apply to the other programs Tiffany talked about, each program makes their own decisions. We have some specific eligibility criteria, and we are, I want to make it very clear, we're not looking for people with research experience. Um, this is a program for students who do not have prior research experience. So if you, you know, all of this sounds kind of new and foreign to you, do not be intimidated. However, we do have um, some baselines that we look at just to make sure that students can be successful in the program and come in able to learn everything they need to learn in the nine weeks that we have. So that includes a 3.0 in your science, engineering, and math courses. And by June 10th, to have completed a, a calculus series. So either two semester courses or three quarter courses as well as three science or engineering courses, one of which has a lab component. So if you've taken your calculus, your physics, and a Python course, there you go. You've met it. And again, this is by spring, the end of spring. So you don't have to have it done now. You don't have to have it done by winter break. It's really by the time the program begins. You also must be age 18 by April 1st and plan to return to your community college. So if you are submitting your applications to transfer right now, and you wanna be here next fall, this isn't um, the best program for you. There are many other programs you're eligible for, but our program is really for people who are going to have one year left at community college. And so that we can provide lots of resources to help you with your application and help you get into your dream school. Finally, unfortunately, we don't um, accept international students. So that would be folks on an F1 or a J1 visa because we're funded by the federal government. Um, there are exceptions for students who are undocumented. So if you are documented or AB 540, um, please reach out to me and, and let's chat because there may be some exceptions there. I'm gonna check the Q&A quickly. Okay, no, I'm not. I'm gonna keep going because there are so many questions, but thank you all for your engagement. So just real quick, this is the 2019 program. This is the last year we had the program in person. And this is um, with our Campanile. All of these students have now transferred um, and about 70% of them came to Berkeley. If you don't know, the, the state transfer rate is about 25% of students transfer within four to six years. So to have all these students have transferred already is a, a big success and we're very proud of them. Um, this man in the middle in the white pants is Professor Jeff Boker. He is the head honcho in charge of the program and um, he is a professor in electrical engineering who was formerly the chair in charge of the whole electrical engineering and computer science department. This is our 2020 cohort. Um, we were fully remote as most programs were just canceled, but we were able to go remote um, for the pandemic with a smaller cohort of folks fully online. They had a really good experience. I was amazed given that it was remote. And then in August, we were able to meet in person. Um, these folks have all transferred as well, including uh, four, four or five of them are at UC Berkeley. And then finally, this last summer, we had a cohort of 19, which was fully remote besides one day that we got to meet in person and some folks coming into their labs occasionally if they were local. Um, and it was a, a really great experience in my opinion. I am going to give you a minute to read some quotes on the screen to convince you if you're not already convinced. And while you do that, I'm going to review the Q&A to see what is pressing.
Okay, we've got lots of questions about eligibility. Pre-calculus does not count towards the two semester calculus courses. Pre-calculus is pre-calculus, so we really need folks who have taken a year of standard calculus. Um, life sciences would count. And some folks are asking, are there limited spots? There are. There are between 10 to 20 spots a year. And we have recently received about 110 to 125 applications. So you can put that at an acceptance rate around 20%. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is competitive. Um, and everyone that I accept always says, I never thought I would get accepted. And I was in class and I was in shock. So I, I strongly encourage you not to rule yourself out. And so the application opens November 10th. It is due January 30th. It is not a rolling application. So is, there is not a pressure to get it turned in in November or December. Um, I do not download them and review them until February 1st. Decisions will be made in April. And people who are from any identity group that is underrepresented in science and engineering is strongly encouraged to attend or to apply. So that includes first generation college students, those from low income backgrounds, students of color, queer and gender um, nonconforming students, student veterans, women, you know, there are unfortunately so many groups that are underrepresented in engineering. And so some quick strategies for applying. Um, I know we're going over my apologies and Tiffany, if you need to go to your next meeting, no worries at all. But um, I, I wanna get through some of these questions. So as Tiffany alluded to, I really encourage you to do your research for any of these programs. Go on their websites, learn about what they're looking for and what type of research they offer and write about that in your application. Um, if you just tell me I'm a computer science major and I want to do computer science, that is not very compelling, compelling to me. It doesn't show a whole amount of motivation or, you know, what is so required for research, which is being a self-directed independent learner, being able to go out and find the information that you need. Um, I've also had students tell me all about the research that they love that's happening at Stanford which to me, I would say, great, go apply for Stanford. Uh, so you really wanna do research into the specific program and the professors that they have. And then read through the application, make sure you know everything that's required. Some of them are long, especially if we take federal funding, there's a lot of questions we have to ask you. Um, so this is an example of our brand new website, very exciting. And what am I showing you here? Oh, I was going to show you how to find the research areas, which um, and the past projects. So on our website, we have a see past projects link, which will take you to our archive full of all past projects. This is a really great way to improve your application is to specifically tell me some of the projects that were interesting to you. You can also watch uh, six hours of YouTube presentations from last year's research cohort. So um, our specific application has two and a half essays. The first half question is, tell me about your research area interests. Which areas do you want to work in? The first fuller length essay is to explain why you wish to conduct research and how this relates to your overall interests and goals, including your transfer plans. And to be specific about how you think this research opportunity will benefit you. So thinking about the things that Tiffany and I introduced sooner, uh, earlier, besides just how to build your application, maybe going online and reading about the experiences of students who have done research. Question two um, relates directly to one of the UC transfer essay questions which is asked because this is a really difficult experience. Doing research is not easy, which is why it's such a rigorous application process. So we um, ask you to describe a major challenge that you have encountered, how you have overcame it, and what you learned about yourself and others as a result. And then we also have some other parts. Uh, 
we ask for two letters of recommendation. And this to me is the most intimidating part, um, but the letters that we receive are really strong and really beautiful. I think even though it doesn't always feel like it, your professors at your community college, your MESA director, your transfer center director, your boss at Chipotle, your religious leader, like they, they see you and they see that um, all that you could bring to this experience. And so they traditionally write really strong um, letters. I would, I think professional courtesy, Tiffany, I would say is like, give them a month to two weeks notice. Is that right? I would, yeah, I would give them a month to two weeks notice. And you know what I would also recommend is um, give them everything, give them the link, give them the deadline, give them a copy of your resume, um, make it easy, make it so, so, so easy for them so they don't have to like search through it. It's hard to say no when, when you have all that stuff. Awesome, thank you. And then we also accept up to five pages of sample work. So this is where you would um, give us, you know, a sample of something you've done that you're proud of, whether it's an exam that you took in your physics course, whether it's a project that you worked on yourself, you built a website, um, just anything that you've done that you think shows the quality of your work. The person who makes the final decision on who is accepted is the professor or graduate student that will be sponsoring that intern. So this is really a way to speak to the engineers and the scientists that will be reviewing your application and show your thought process and what you bring to the table. And then of course, ask questions if you're unsure or unclear of anything that's on the application. I am very good at responding to email and I will get back to you. And so to learn more, you can go to our brand new website, which is engineering.berkeley.edu forward slash TTE. And you could also email me at Nicole McIntyre at berkeley.edu. And um, my email address is on the website as well. So again, the application opens November 10th and it closes January 30th. So that is the end of the presentation. I am going to stop screen sharing and go through the 32 questions we have. <laughs> um, and again, if you put your question in the chat, please be sure to put it into the Q&A because that is where I'm looking for questions. So do you suggest that we mention the underrepresented groups that we are part of in our application? It will be included in the demographic information um, but yeah, I mean, if, if your identities are relevant to your career goals, your experiences as a researcher, the challenges you've overcome, then yes, do mention them in your application. Uh, as I said earlier, there's not yet a list of this year's confirmed professors or labs that will be participating in the program. I would expect it to look pretty similar to last year. Um, and I hope to have it online by the beginning of January when those professors confirm. Um, if I am a community college student and I haven't done all the required courses at my community college, can I use high school courses? You can if you have uh, passed AP or IB tests to fulfill those requirements, but we're looking for college level courses. So um, just normal high school level biology would not count because we need you to have a solid college uh, level background. You do not get to see the letters that your teachers send. Professional standard for letters of recommendation is that you ask people that you trust to write a letter blindly. Um, you could maybe ask them but uh, the application system will ask you to include their email addresses and we will email them directly asking for the letter of recommendation and they upload it to our website. So at no point does that conversation go through you. You cannot submit a YouTube video that you made a sample work. You can submit a PDF and you can include a link to a YouTube video, but I can't promise that a professor is going to um, take the time to access YouTube and watch it. So I would suggest also including a text summary of what that video shows. 
um, what, you know, what is so great? What did you accomplish? Why, why is this what you want to show us? Um, the letters of right letters of recommendation can be written by anyone. Again, like the general UC application, you know, there is no black and white. This is allowed, this isn't allowed, this counts, this doesn't. But you want to make the most compelling argument for yourself possible. And if you're applying to say, I'm gonna be really good at doing STEM research, your application is gonna be made stronger by having professors or people who can talk about your STEM skills. Uh, that being said, I accept people every year who don't have two letters of recommendation from STEM professors, because that's hard to get, right? Especially if you're at a school where you have been or you're still doing Zoom school, but it can definitely help if they're able to talk to your technical ability. But I've, you know, accepted people who have letters of recommendation from their boss at Chipotle, from a mentor that they got through a community-based organization, from their supervisor at Burning Man, like lots of different things. There is no right or wrong. <laughs> um, TTE is specifically for students who will be returning to their community college at the end of the program. So if you are submitting your application to transfer this fall, you unfortunately have missed your TTE window, but you can apply to all of the other programs that are on the websites that Tiffany shared. So again, TTE, you must be returning to your community college in fall 2022 to be eligible. And that's a lot of dates, so it's confusing. Um, okay, and again, if you want to log off, I know we are past time, I will not be hurt. Um, I'm just gonna keep going through these questions. The conferences mentioned, I believe Tiffany mentioned SACNIS, which is the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in STEM. And they have a really great conference, including a community college day. And um, do you remember what the other one you mentioned was, Tiffany? Uh, yeah, SHIP, which is the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. And fun fact, if you come to Berkeley, uh, we will pay for you to go to SHIP. Uh, we're, we have about 45 students going just from engineering, so, and NSBE as well, National Society of Black Engineers, that is in the spring. And if you're part of TTE, I have funding to send you to conferences too, so um, if you're accepted to present your research at, a, at research at a conference, I can help pay for your registration fees and for your flights. Um, I think at least half of this summer's cohort are presenting their research at the SACNAS conference this year, um, but it's remote, so they're not traveling. Would someone be able to do TTE and take summer courses at the same time? No, we are a full-time program and a, most likely, hopefully, an in-person program this summer. So we do expect you to have full capacity to participate in the program, be um, fully available to spend time in the lab and to do the assignments, which include things like writing a paper about your research and working on your um, application essay questions. Um, and I think the, a part of it too is really having that embedded UC Berkeley experience and to get to see what it's like to be a UC Berkeley student. And if you're commuting home to do community college, or if you're you know, on Zoom 15 hours a week instead of going to San Francisco with your fellow interns, that can be a little bit harder. Um, is TEP only for science and engineering? Are there any for CS or economics majors? Um, there is research in all different types of field. Uh, this program is TTE. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but CS is a science and it is an engineering. So we definitely have lots of CS research happening. We do not have economics in our specific program, no. Here's a great question, Tiffany, that I wonder if we could answer together, which is these opportunities are great, but what about students who are employed and can't take nine weeks off work? What options would you maybe recommend to them? So first of all, I would say um, if you are working full-time and going to school, 
absolutely 100% positively uh, be sure, let me just turn the lights off, be sure that, um, that you include that on your transfer application um, because that shows time management, that shows initiative, that shows a lot. Um, if you're not able to take time off to do a summer research program, then certainly um, doing research um, uh, during the academic year remotely is, is an option as well, or doing an independent research project would be also another option as well. Um, but definitely if you're, if you're uh, working and you're not able to, um, to take time off, that doesn't mean that you can't do uh, extracurricular you know, uh, educational experiences. It just means that you wouldn't be able to do a, a formal program. Um, but as we mentioned, and also, um, I would also uh, maybe, you know, talk to your community college. I know like NIH Bridges, for example, uh, when I used to work with the NIH Bridges program at San Francisco State, I did have students that, um, that worked as well. Uh, so that is, you know, an option. Usually they're flexible. But I want to reiterate, uh, taking classes and doing programs in the summer is always a recipe for disaster. So don't do that because, you know, you will double book yourself and, and that's not that's not a good thing. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if I'm not an engineering major, but I took courses that fulfill the requirements, can I apply? You can if you're interested in our research. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, can we submit more than two letters of recommendation? No, you cannot. Um, can we include in progress projects for the sample work? Absolutely. Yes. Um, Nahalia, I would maybe encourage you to email us directly about the EBT program. Uh, Okay. How can I make my application stand out? Um, honestly, I think I've, I've given you the bulk of it on, on my slides, right? Which is those two essay questions and the two letters of recommendation. Um, thinking about genuinely, why do you want to do research? What is it you want to get out of it? Um, especially intrinsic motivations, not just I want my application to look good so I get into UC Davis, but like, how do you think you will grow and benefit as a scientist or an engineer or a scholar? And how does it fit into what you think you might wanna do long-term? Uh, specifically being able to speak to why our research projects, and you know, they might sound really high and mighty. They might be really difficult to read about because this is not material that is taught in community colleges. And that's totally normal and okay. Um, but I would encourage you to try to take some time to work through them and to like have Wikipedia open in another tab. Um, because to me, an application stands out when I can tell that someone has really put the time and effort into trying to understand difficult concepts, because that is what a lot of the program will be. Um, yeah, that, that's the bulk of it. Um, it is okay if it's a group project, I would, uh, encourage you to maybe speak specifically to what you contributed so it doesn't look like you're trying to pass off someone else's work as your own. Um, and then we have a question about the difference between TTE and REU. This is a great question. REU stands for Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And this basically could be used synonymously with research internship. It's, it's just a broad category. Um, a lot of REU programs are those ones funded by the National Science Foundation that we showed you on their website. TTE, Transferred Excellence, is just one example of an REU. Um, it is the one that I run here at UC Berkeley in the College of Engineering. Um, so REU would be like using part-time job and TTE would be like using, you know, Target as the employer. It's just, um, one specific example of an REU program. And um, Tiffany, I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but if your GPA was just short of the minimum requirements for a research program, 
Would you encourage a student to apply or would you say maybe that's not worth their time? Um, if it's like, you know, maybe just, maybe they want a 3-0 and you have a 2-9-9-9. Um, yeah, if they want a 3-5 and you have a 2-4, maybe not. Um, and then also sometimes your technical GPA, you know, I mean, maybe you, maybe you flunked a tennis class, right? They're not going to be so worried about the tennis class, right? But um, I mean, you know, I, I would, I mean, as long as if it's, if it's just shy, you know, and maybe explain, uh, explain, and, you know, just to kind of reiterate, um, you know, somebody asked, how do you make my application stand out? I would say be honest and be genuine. I mean, we get so many applications from students who just kind of tell us what we want to hear. But when you're, um, you know, when you have that, you know, letter of recommendation from your boss at Burning Man, when you, you know, you're working at Chipotle and you're going to three different community colleges, we want those real stories. I mean, that that is memorable. I have admitted both of those students and they have been, yeah. so I agree. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what we want to hear. We don't, you, we don't want to hear the, you know, don't try and impress us. We're already impressed with you. <laughs> so tell us who you are and be, and be very honest about who you are because you'll stand out, you know? Don't tell us how fantastic Berkeley is. We work here, we know it's an amazing place. We wanna hear about you and, and what your experience is and what you're gonna bring to the table. Absolutely. And I can tell you that those students, for me, that's a stronger application. If I am able to understand more about you and maybe you've had a bit of a life journey, that that can definitely compensate for some lower grades compared to, you know, someone that goes to school full time and does nothing else and has a 4.0. All right. I'm going to um, answer two last questions and then I'm going to wrap up for the day. Um, oh, they keep coming in. If you have specific <laughs> questions, I really encourage you to answer or to email me directly. Um, but we ask for your application, your GPA at the time of application. And then if we don't have your full GPA, I will follow up with you and ask for your updated transcript in the spring. So just put what's on your transcript when you apply and we'll update it later. Um, and uh, I can't speak as to whether having previous research experience will make your application stronger or weaker. It really, it's a holistic process. So it's not black or white. It kind of is how, you know, your whole application aligns with the projects that we have um, and, you know, what you say in the rest of it. It won't rule you out. It won't make you stronger. It really just depends. And so with that, those of you that have personal questions, I encourage you to email me directly. I'll put my email in the chat one last time. And thank you so much for coming. I really, really hope that you do not repeat my mistake and that you get involved in research sooner. Um, if you're eligible, I think the Transfer to Excellence program is just an amazing opportunity, which is why I chose to run it. Um, but there, are, if you're not eligible, there are so many other options and you definitely should apply for more than just one. And Tiffany's website, reufinder.com is a huge asset for seeing many of those in one place. All right, okay, I hope y'all have a great rest of your Wednesday. Tiffany, thank you so much for being here. Thank and you. Great. And um, we'll see you at our final three webinars on November 2nd and November 10th. Take care.